COVID-19 showed us all the importance of having an at-home broadband connection. The FCC's new Emergency Broadband Benefit Program, or EBB, makes having internet access affordable for Latino households by providing up to $50 a month to help pay for the cost of your internet service. This new benefit is available to all Latino families, even mixed-status families, as long as someone in your household has an ITIN number or has a student who receives free or reduced school lunch. The time is now to connect your family to the future of everything. Learn how at ebbparami.org. COVID-19 has underscored the important and essential role that digital connectivity plays in every aspect of our lives, from healthcare to education, to ensuring that we all have the digital skills necessary to succeed in today's digital economy. Broadband has become the critical link to each other and to the world. Unfortunately, Latino, Black, and Indigenous communities continue to remain some of the most underconnected members of our society, many citing the cost as the main barrier to adoption. In order to meet uh, the connectivity needs of low-income households um, or those experiencing an economic hardship due to COVID-19, Congress appropriated $3.2 billion to the FCC to help households afford broadband service and connected internet service devices. The Emergency Broadband Benefit Program provides eligible households with a discount of up to $50 a month to subscribe to broadband service or to offset the cost of an existing subscription, as well as a one-time device discount of up to $100 for a laptop, desktop computer, or tablet purchased through a participating internet service provider. The EBB program has one distinguishing feature for all of their COVID relief programs, and that is that this is an important economic relief program is available to all Latino families, regardless of their immigration status. As long as someone in their household has an I-10 number or at least or has a student that qualifies for the free or reduced lunch programs. This new eligibility criteria allows for the Emergency Broadband Benefit Program to serve as an important on-ramp towards digital opportunity for historically excluded or underserved communities, and with it, the challenge to ensure that those who would benefit the most from this program have the necessary support to navigate the online enrollment process of the National Verifier, know which participating internet service providers are available in their area, and to understand how to select an internet service plan that meets their family's connectivity needs and will be affordable to them in the long run. Today, HETP member organizations in partnership with other national Latino organizations and influential Latino leaders launch EBB Para Mi, a first of its kind bilingual digital platform that supports Latino households through every step of the EBB enrollment process. EBB Para Mi is, is a new online uh, digital platform that prompts people to choose um, their language either in English or in Spanish um, and makes available clear, easy to understand instructions about what the Emergency Broadband Benefit Program is, how to check your eligibility, um, clear kind of uh, communication about this is a, a temporary discount for up to $50 a month, um, walks people through um, the three important steps, you know, uh, how to verify the eligibility, choose an internet service provider, or select a plan that fits your family's needs. Um, we have partnered with, with national Latino organizations across the country um, to ensure that this information gets out to as many people as possible. We've also, um, at a recommendation of, of one of our partners, also increased the, um, the accessibility of, of the website and the information by producing um, video segments that walk people through a lot of this um, long kind of uh, text about how to enroll, who is eligible, and, and how to make uh, the appropriate determinations to fit your family's needs. So we're really proud of, of this effort. Um, and it's and it's gonna be set up, um, it's, it's actually live now and it's ready to, to guide people through the process, as well as if you click under resources, um, we are developing resources that uh, national or local community organizations can download um, and print or share to ensure that um, they also have the tools necessary to, um, to share the information about the program. So we have five by seven postcards in both English and Spanish that are ready to print. All people have to do is download them and use any kind of online vendor. We have some suggestions um, of, of online vendors that, that, that we're making. We have, um, this week we are launching some in infographics that will be available for download to all of our partners, as well as personalized graphics from all of our uh, Latino leaders across the country uh, to help kind of share their story about why they feel internet connectivity is important to our community. So with the launch of this new effort, HTTP is doing everything in its power to not only connect people to the internet and provide them with the support necessary to ensure the families 
with limited digital preparedness are able to make informed decisions about how to meet their families' connection needs. But we're also working with Congress and the FCC, as well as convening national Latino leaders to ensure that the emergency broadband benefit and other FCC programs meet the growing needs of Latino households across the country. Today, we are honored to have Representative Mark Vesey, who introduced the emergency broadband benefit um, who introduced the Emergency Broadband Connections Act, which established the Emergency Broadband Benefit, as well as acting FCC Chairwoman Rosen Warsaw, um, who was charged with the task of setting up and implementing the EBB program in record time. So thank you both for joining us today. Representative VC, I'd love to start our conversation with you. As an original co-sponsor of the Accessible Affordable Internet for All Act that comprehensively examines our broadband infrastructure and how to create real opportunities for everyone across the nation to have access to fast and reliable internet, um, you've become one of the leading champions on Capitol Hill working to expand broadband access for low-income families and communities of color. Do you mind sharing some deeper context into what fuels your leadership on this issue and what more you think Congress can do to make a universal broadband a reality? Yeah, no, absolutely. Well, you know, the, the district that I represent is, you know, majority Hispanic and black. My district is, if you add it up, uh, Hispanic and black is so over 80% Hispanic and black. Uh, and not only that, uh, it's, you know, most of the neighborhoods that I represent are lower income neighborhoods and which surprises a lot of people because we've been so we've had so much growth and we've been so prosperous here in the Dallas Fort Worth area. Uh, but uh, the reality is that the district that I represent, there are only a handful of districts around the country that have a lower uh, uh, per capita household median income uh, than Congressional District 33 here in Texas. Uh, and so for me, being able to provide opportunity uh, for these communities in Fort Worth and Dallas, uh, for lower income uh, 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 neighborhoods, for communities that have been marginalized are hugely uh, important. Uh, because if you don't have access to the internet, you really are disconnected from the world today. It's not like, uh, you know, it was in the, in the 70s and 80s, <laughs> where you could be disconnected from certain aspects of uh, of life and society, but you could still uh, function. I mean, internet is really something that everyone uh, has to have access to from everything from your job, work, school, uh, you know, being able to uh, just uh, be able to do just basic functions now really requires that you have uh, some sort of uh, connection. And if you don't want your kids to be left behind in particular, uh, I think that is, is critically important. Um, uh, you know, we're, I think that we're, we're, moving in the right direction when it comes to making sure that low-income communities are connected. But I also still think that we have a lot of work ahead of us, uh, a long way to go in really being able to reach these uh, communities uh, fully. And so that's why I'm always going to uh, spend my time in Congress making sure uh, that this issue is addressed. I appreciate that. Thank you so much. Um, so, Chairwoman Rosenwalter, one thing that I think should really be applauded about the Emergency Broadband Benefit Program, or you know, the EBB, is that from the time that Congress appropriated the funds at the end of March to the public launch of the program, the FCC had little more than about 60 days to build the digital infrastructure needed to make uh, this benefit a reality. Um, it, it's safe to say that you and your staff have been very busy, um, and I wonder if you wouldn't mind sharing with us a little bit of the behind the scenes process and what it took uh, to stand up this important program in such record time. Thank you so much, Alejandro. And thank you for the work you're doing with EBB Para Mi and also just your um, uh, being a resource for us during this uh, very busy time. I also wanna thank uh, Congressman Fizi because his leadership made this happen. Um, he's legitimately the father of this program and it is undeniably good stuff. For the first time ever, we have a nationwide broadband affordability program. I can't emphasize enough how big that is. You know, before this pandemic, we used to think going online, well, that was nice to have, but it's need to have now for work, for school, for home. And despite all of that, there is some, some kid somewhere who's sitting outside of a fast food restaurant right now just to go online to go to school. There's probably some parent who is lingering outside of a library or municipal building to go online for work. And there are others who are not signing up for vaccines because they don't have that access right now. 
So here's a program that can actually help, right? $50 a month in support for low-income households. So we can help close the digital divide, which isn't only about deployment in rural America, it's about making sure that urban and suburban America get online too. And so my staff, and um, we worked with lightning speed. We tried to get this up and running as fast as possible because we know we are coming out of a pandemic. We've got an economic crisis. And every day we wait, we slow down the connectivity in households that need it and could benefit from it. So we tried to also, as you said, make this program as streamlined and simple as possible. You don't need a social security number to sign up. A driver's license, a student getting free and reduced lunch would do. We tried to make the process um, available to so many people in different languages. But uh, in the end, what's going to matter most is hearing from trusted authorities in the communities where people who need this program live. And so that's why the work you're doing and Congressman Vesey is doing is so important. Thank you again, uh, both for, for your introductory comments. And I wonder if uh, Chairwoman Rosenwald, sort of, if you wouldn't mind sharing, you know what, these were kind of big um, not only um, value shifts in, in the emergency broadband benefit program, but also I think um, architectural shifts with the way that um, the, the, the behind the scenes infrastructure um, and enrollment process is, is kind of uh, delivered to, uh, to communities. So do you mind sharing a little bit about what did that kind of back and forth look like? Um, what kind of stakeholders you engaged to kind of ensure that um, that process was meeting um, both, I think, the values of the new administration and the FCC. Um, yeah, we just love some some insight because I know that I kind of have a vantage point in, into that, but I know that some <laughs> of our partners might take for granted all the hard work that you and your staff really put into this to make that a possibility. Uh, well, would you like me to start there? Um, yeah, please. So we we knew pretty quickly that if we just preached about this from Washington, D.C., this program would not reach very far. So my staff decided we we're going to do outreach to all sorts of local trusted institutions, faith organizations, boys and girls clubs, go to the Department of Labor, ask them about their employment centers. I mean, we, we got as creative as we could. But then we also decided to set up a portal online and said, hey, if you want to get information about this program, our toolkits, so you can work with people in your hometown, you sign up. And what's rewarding is we got more than 11,000 people and organizations to sign up for those materials. I mean, I just think that there are people who want to get the word out, who want to get households connected, and we got to figure out how to get them the information they need. So the FCC did set up a toolkit. We've got materials in nine different languages. They're all designed to be cut and paste into other documents, other templates, other formats, whatever it is that local organizations and institutions can use to reach people where they are. I think that's the ticket to success here. And um, we're really invested in figuring out how to get these materials into the hands of people who know what's happening in their own backyard. And last week you actually announced that um, more than 1 million people have already enrolled. You know what? One week, one week, one, week. one million people. Which, which I think kind of speaks to the need, but also I think hopefully informs um, I think the question is, what have you learned about the people, the types of people that are enrolling in, in the program and what has their experience been so far? So um, I do want to be data driven as we do this, but I also want to be mindful that the first week may not be emblematic of the whole program. But my great hope is that we can take information that we gather from this program. Who signs up? What areas of the country? Um, what providers are really good at getting people online? What organizations were really active at helping people sign up? And then we can present all this information to folks like Congressman Vesey, who might get asked at some point, what does the successor program look like? And I think that Congress can create one if they have the data that we're going to be collecting. And um, it's, of course, not just data. We want to have some anecdotes from you and the communities you're working with, too, because um, I think there are going to be stories to told about families we got online people who are able to get jobs, people who could keep up with their health care appointments virtually as a result. And I think those narratives are important too. So I hope that uh, HTTP and everyone on this call will share them with us. I appreciate that. Representative VC, you've already, I, I think, championed uh, uh, a funding extension for the Emergency Broadband Benefit Program. Can you, can you walk us through kind of how that came about um, and what your kind of long-term vision for the program might be based on what we know today? 
Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, you know, for for me again, you know, the affordability piece is uh, is key. And I just want to touch on something that the commissioner uh, talked about a little bit. Also, uh, you know, I have a, 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 a in addition to representing Dallas and Fort Worth, I also represent smaller suburbs. Uh, and one of the cities that I represent, uh, Forest Hill, uh, they had a really uh, big debate back in the. Oh, God, probably, I want to say in the early 2000s about whether or not they were going to build a library because uh, of the the city's proximity and closeness to Fort Worth. They didn't want to uh, uh, build. They thought it would be a waste of taxpayers money to build a library. And I think that what a lot of people were missing was that, uh, you know, especially at that time, as as still the Internet was still sort of, you know, kind of building up. Uh, was that uh, that libraries, you know, they're not the traditional libraries that people have, you know, nowadays, that libraries are really learning centers for kids to come and get connected. And when the commissioner was talking about people sitting outside doing their homework, uh, that she was absolutely correct. And I saw that up close and personal when these kids, again, you're talking about a community that's pretty evenly split between black and, and Hispanic kids. Uh, and when that library op- first opened and they finally got the money to open those doors, to see those kids in there uh, on those computers, uh, signing up to use them in a very orderly, nice fashion was uh, really just absolutely incredible. Uh, and and they're, they're really very eager for this information. They want this information. They're hungry for it. They want to be connected. They want to be able to learn uh, and they want to be able to do it in a safe uh, environment uh, like that. And so we we have to continue to look for ways uh, that we're going to uh, come up with funding, uh, that we're going to make sure uh, that this can be continual. And that was really the sort of whole the thought behind it was making sure uh, that we that we kept this stream going, because for every young person that, you know, that that graduates from, you know, being in elementary school or middle school and sitting in the library, you know, working on the computers, reading, doing their work, and they go on to college. There are younger kids in those same neighborhoods that are coming up right behind them uh, that are going to continue uh, to also need this information to the younger brothers and sisters, the younger cousins, uh, and the new families that move in. Uh, and we just want to make sure that they continue to have these opportunities. And again, it's going to be a challenge. One of the reasons why it's going to be a challenge is that remember too, that the technology doesn't stop. Uh, the technology that we have today uh, is, 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 is a lot different than it was in, in previous generations. You know, before when you in the 70s or 80s, when you got your Curtis Mathis television, you know, you probably had that same television for maybe 10, 15, 20 years. Now the technology uh, is so much more rapid and moves so much uh, 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 is is, is just in uh, deployed and distributed so differently. And we have to make sure that lower income neighborhoods uh, continue to have access uh, to that uh, type of information. And I think that that's you know, it was really the, the key and most important part of all of it. Absolutely. And and I think, you know, part of the, the real kind of big vision for this convening today was to allow uh, both of you to hear from Latino leaders who really are at the front lines and work with um, frontline communities to kind of share what they know, um, what they're hearing, and, and kind of provide some, some thoughts about how we can continue to work together to ensure that this information, this program reaches as many people as possible. Um, I'd like to kind of kick off our, our Q&A discussion with Latino leaders with two um, dynamic women who unfortunately had a, a conflict today and were not able to join us, but submitted um, a couple of written questions. Um, so I want to start the Q&A with um, a question submitted by Jenna Marguya, President and CEO for Unidas U.S. And she asked, you know, an unfortunate uh, corollary to the overrepresentation of Latinos in the digital divide is a gap in digital literacy skills which exacerbates many existing inequities ranging from the homework gap to disparate health outcomes, but also means that awareness and uptake of support programs like the EDB becomes that much more difficult for hard to reach communities like the Latino and and immigrant households. Um, So beyond kind of partnering with organizations with ties to these communities, like the ones represented on this call, 
what more can be done to ensure that eligible households most marginalized by the digital divide are being centered in program outreach and engagement. And um, I will also add that, that, that Cindy Benavid, the CEO of LULAC, similarly asked, you know, how can Congress and the FCC work together to ensure that they are allocating funding to either offer outreach grants to expand the capacity of its outreach partners or to grow the internal outreach capacity of the FCC? And I'm happy to, um, to start with you, Representative BC. Yeah, um, here's a, here, here's what I would say, Alejandro, that when it comes to making sure that we have continual funding for these type of programs, it, it has to be made a priority. I mean, the same way how we make Social Security a priority and we make, you know, Medicare and other things that we consider essential spending, uh, we ha- we absolutely have to make it a priority. And uh, I was just on the on a call on a Zoom call earlier today talking with someone about uh, uh, about artificial intelligence uh, and about the dis- uh, displacement of jobs, for instance. And, you know, we have all these new jobs that are being created by this new technology that's driving uh, our economy now. And a lot of people think that AI is going to displace people and it will displace some people. Uh, but I think that was what we're really going to see and what we're really going to struggle with. And I think that we can prevent that if we can continually look for ways to make sure that uh, communities of color uh, are connected uh, is that you're going to have all these new jobs that are created uh, and you're going to have people that aren't going to be able to do those jobs. And you're going to particularly see that in lower income uh, uh, neighborhoods like the ones that I represent. Uh, and so in, in order to, to prevent that from happening, uh, we need to make sure uh, that we're giving our kids um, uh, uh, as much uh, technological based uh, 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 education as they possibly can have. And that starts with them being able to be connected because the fact of the matter is, is that if we're only going to rely on them uh, to have that level of connection when they're at, at school, then there's no way they're ever going to be able to, to keep up with the rest of the world. It's just not, it's just not going to happen. Uh, and as a dad, and I have a 15 year old, uh, that's, that's after, you know, being away from school for, uh, you know, an entire year doing virtual school, hallelujah, that he's back in, in the classroom setting. Uh, but, you know, I got to see up close uh, and, and personal just how important it was uh, for him uh, to be connected. And then I also know, too, with the extra uh, uh, academic uh, help and work that he does in the house, that if that if we didn't have that connection, there's just it should it would be impossible for him to keep up. It would absolutely be impossible for him to keep up. And we need to make sure that all families have that level of access, because, uh, again, uh, if not, we're just going to to, to create a larger uh, underclass of individuals that uh, that that won't be uh, that won't have these this same level of opportunity available to them. Uh, and, you know, we should want to pay for it because it's good, you know, for all of us in the long term. Uh, to make sure that uh, that we have these communities connected and that we're expanding this level of of scholarship and opportunity, because at the end of the day, it's 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 what's going to drive the future of our economy, and we want to and we want to make sure uh, that the young people in the districts, like the ones that I represent around the country, that they have an opportunity to play a, a part in it. Otherwise, you know, we'll fall behind not just here in the United States, but we'll fall behind globally if we don't take this seriously. Yeah. Chairwoman? Yeah. Um, amen to everything that Congressman Vesey just said. I agree with all of it. Uh, sometimes the way that I talk about this is I say we need 100% policy. Like we need 100% of our households to have electricity, to have clean water, and to have reliable and consistent internet access. 100%. Doesn't matter who you are, where you live, or where you came from. And that should be our national goal nothing less. And I know that we are now getting these new programs like the Emergency Broadband Benefit and the Emergency Connectivity Fund to reach more people in more places. But I also know this, as Congress looks to broadband and infrastructure going forward, I hope some thought is given to funding outreach and funding digital literacy, because I think those are really logical complements and can make a meaningful difference you know, in getting a certain percentage of our households online. So I hope that becomes part of the conversation 
even if it wasn't part of the statutory framework with the emergency broadband benefit. Absolutely. So up next, uh, we are delighted to have Ramiro Cavazos, who is the president and CC CEO of the United States Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. Ramiro, welcome. Thank you, Alejandro. Thank you for your leadership as our executive director for the Hispanic Technology and Telecommunications Partnership. I also want to thank uh, Brent for his chairmanship, uh, Congressman VC, and of course, uh, Chairwoman, thank you for your thoughtful answers. On behalf of the United States Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, we represent 5 million Hispanic-owned businesses, more than 250 Hispanic chambers around the country and in Puerto Rico. And of course, we are the voice of uh, the 61 million Latinos, many of them, uh, those small business owners uh, struggling with uh, the gap that we find, uh, of course, in broadband. For us, the question is uh, pretty straightforward. I think that you are uh, sensitive to the needs of our community that how is, if you could uh, share with us, uh, the federal government taking action to promote broadband deployment, especially in underserved areas of the country. We've been underserved when it comes to capital, underserved in so many ways, but now how is the federal government filling that gap uh, to make sure that we support our communities? And I wanna thank all of my colleagues on the line right now, solidarity and partnerships and collaboration are critical. So Alejandro, that's my question to the Congresswoman, Congressman and, and of course our, our Chairwoman. Thank you. Yeah, who wants, who do you want to, who would you like to go first, Alejandro? Uh, Representative VC. Let's let's go. Let's go, uh, Representative VC, and then uh, Chairwoman throughout our, our next few questions. Yeah, I do think that deployment is going to be uh, something that is, you know, going to continue to, to be a challenge. Obviously, when you start talking about deployment, uh, you're essentially talking about infrastructure uh, and being able to make sure that, uh, uh, that 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 people have, you know, access to broadband. I mean, even in even in Fort Worth, the neighborhood that I live in now, uh, I don't have access to all of the people that provide uh, internet service. I don't have access to the highest speeds. We have access to internet, but I don't have access to the highest speeds for all the carriers. So it's interesting. I have one uh, 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 digital uh, uh, video provider, and then I have another uh, internet provider, so I can get the fastest, you know, uh, uh, speeds. And so. You know, making sure that uh, that all communities uh, are connected uh, is is important. And and even though the 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 the, the almost zero connection uh, type issues that we talk about are mainly discussed when it comes to rural uh, Texas. Even there are some parts of Dallas here that uh, in, that are lower income areas where there is really not a good connection or signal at all. Uh, and and trying to figure out how you can do that uh, and make it affordable, I think, has to be a challenge uh, that 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 we figure out how to rise to the occasion. Um, I do think that that there are some products uh, available that are being talked about that hopefully can 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 make it easier. Um, uh, you know, there's been a lot of talk about low orbit uh, satellites and people being able to get receivers. And having an internet signal sent to them the same way how you uh, may get your video services sent to you now uh, by, with, by putting a satellite on top of your house. So there's been uh, discussion about that. Uh, but I would like to urge everybody to pay very close attention to the president's um, uh, infrastructure bill uh, because he is addressing this issue that we're talking about today in the infrastructure bill. Um, you know, I when I. You know, and there have been some criticisms of the infrastructure bill. But one of the things that I've talked about, and I'm, what, I, what I've tried to do as representative, is really split the infrastructure bill up into two different pieces. We absolutely know that uh, that we need to work on the meat and potatoes of infrastructure in this country. That we have a lot of crumbling bridges and roads that need to be repaired, and so that's the more meat and potatoes. But we also need to talk about the future of infrastructure. And the future of infrastructure is doing things like making sure that we have broadband uh, expansion, adequate broadband expansion uh, that not only reaches our urban and suburban areas and makes it more affordable, uh, but also having it deployed uh, around the country. So uh, if it doesn't matter if you if you live in, in, in Fort Worth and your lower income or if you happen to work 
uh, on a ranch and you work in agriculture and your kids go to school in a small farming uh, community, making sure that those young people have access to the Internet, too. Uh, and the president's infrastructure bill uh, will cover ground in a lot of those areas. And we need to make sure that we get that passed. Thank you. Um, so I, the way I tend to think about the digital divide is there's really two issues. <laughs> the first is we've got households that are not adopting it, often because they can't afford it. And the really good news is with the work of the congressman and his colleagues, we now have this emergency broadband benefit, which is going to help address that for the first time ever. But we also have this deployment challenge in rural, sometimes suburban communities, and sometimes urban communities with digital redlining, we don't actually have the infrastructure present. That's why I like when you said not just unserved, but underserved, right? They don't have the infrastructure that allows them full participation in the digital age. And so we are seeing more energy directed to broadband in Congress than I've ever seen in my professional lifetime. And it's making me optimistic. We're going to be able to address that because more funds are gonna flow. And in the meantime, the FCC is getting ready. We are actually trying to develop far more accurate broadband maps that tell us where service is and is not around the country. We're not just gonna rely on the carriers to tell us. When we get their data, we're gonna turn around to communities and say, tell us what's happening in your backyard. Double check and triple check the information I have because we know that there are communities being left behind that our maps don't capture. And so we hope we're gonna have data like that that can help Congress and inform where those funds flow. So two things, affordability, adoption, and deployment, both are necessary for us to really get to 100%. I appreciate that. Thank you, Ramiro. Antonio, it looks like you have a question as well. Um, thank you very much, Alejandro and Brent, for your leadership. And uh, Congressman VC, thank you. And Chair Rosenworcel, you've been at this lucha for a very long time. I remember our trip to Oak Cliff, Dallas, where you saw firsthand why we've been so committed to this issue. And I just have to tell you, um, the first thing I thought of when all of this is being put forth was the amount of work and passion and integrity that you've had in dealing with this issue way before everyone else, I think, caught up with it. So just thank you. Um, thank you. But you were there at the start, too. You should, you, uh, that's I was why following you know. your lead. <laughs> yeah. And it was, you're, you know, and it was in Texas where you brought me first. So uh, we'll forget that, too. You're a true luchadora. And I just thank you for that. So I, I've said that there's no vaccine for the um, educational crisis from the pandemic. And, and that I think this plan is the closest thing that we have to that. Um, the health and economic and other crises are going to bounce back um, way before the impact on our children, our country and their education. Um, and so the digital divide or the homework gap, as you put it, uh, Chair, was just grew even bigger um, because of the pandemic. And we're Latinx and other minorities as well as in rural areas. And there's a growing population of Latinos in those rural areas, which is a double whammy, are most affected. So what is is there a bounce back plan? specifically uh, beyond the, the bill um, that we can collectively address to, to just um, be able to get back on track in terms of um, education and the, um, and the workforce development pieces to this um, that have been set back, I think, for, um, for years, uh, could be you know, five to 10 years, they're saying it could be impacted in terms of being able to bounce back from this. And there's 3 million um, kids that just zoomed out. They just stopped showing up to Zooms that they can't find. So um, because of many, because of lack of access to adequate um, internet. Uh, so uh, is there a plan in place in terms of uh, bouncing back from the disastrous educational crisis that has been over, overlooked, I think, to some extent because of the, the financial and, and health crises? Representative VC, do you, do do you want to take a stab at that one? Oh yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I'm very concerned about that. It's something that I've been spending a lot of time uh, talking about, a lot of time addressing. Uh, my, you know, my son has, uh, you know, I mentioned before, he's been back at school now for probably about two months or so. 
Uh, and uh, and he the school the public school that he goes to in Fort Worth, uh, it was a small school anyway. It's all boys school. And it was grade six through 12, uh, probably, you know, 400 or so boys that are there. Uh, and some of them are back in person and the other ones are supposed to be doing what they they have a hybrid type option for you to participate in. Uh, but there is a, a pretty significant number that they just can't find. And, it's, and in some schools, it's even higher. Uh, and I'm very concerned about that. I think that this is something that we're probably going to study for a long time about what sort of impact that it's had. Uh, on our young people. Uh, and we need to really start taking seriously now how we can minimize this uh, and, 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 and try to make sure that kids are getting extra supplemental help that they need. Uh, if there's extra help over the summer, uh, perhaps uh, where they need to be caught up. Because for a lot of these, you know, you know majors in college, for instance, that are, you know, tech related, uh, where a lot of the money and a lot of opportunity is going to be. If you don't have the basic uh, building blocks when you graduate from high school, it's going to be really tough uh, for you to go to, you know, Texas A&M or University of Texas or one of our other great universities here in the Lone Star State and be able to really compete for these jobs that are out uh, in the market uh, if you miss that much schooling. And so, uh, it, I, it is something that I'm worried about that it keeps that 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 keeps me up at night and even personally with my own son. I asked him, I said, how do you think that you did during uh, the online portion? And he said it was good. But, you know, I, I worry, um, uh, you know, because of that. And so it, it's it's going to be it's going to be something that we have to look at. And now that we're, uh, you know, primarily talking about, uh, uh, you know, uh, tech related things here. But like, for instance, you know, labs in school, my son is uh, is doing chemistry, but had very little lab work uh, for chemistry because he did so much of it online. And so it's things like that that I'm that I'm worried about for all of our young people, because, again, those are basic building blocks that they need. Uh, and when it comes to technology in particular uh, and making it easier uh, for them to keep up as much as they possibly can during this this time, I think is is going to be critical. And. And I know that there are gaps uh, and 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 at some point or another, we're going to have to address them. Uh, Antonio, you've always been um, uh, insightful and eloquent on this issue and no exception here. We are not coming out of this pandemic like we came in and we've got populations that are uh, are going to come off worse off and they're not going to we're not going to repair that immediately. It is something we need to be mindful of. Um, I think that's definitely true uh, with Latino populations, with black and brown populations, with women who are so often, you know, our economy's social safety net. Uh, and that's definitely true with students. We have lost some students uh, to schooling, and particularly in some large districts. Many of them have just not shown up to virtual class. Some have been locked out of the virtual classroom because they don't have internet access or devices. So, um, so let me change my tone and get optimistic for a second, because on May 10th, the FCC did something. We took the American Rescue Plan and we created the nation's emergency connectivity fund, which is the first homework gap fund we've ever had. It's $7.17 billion that is going to go to schools and libraries across the country to help them get kids, students connected at home. That means loaning out wireless hotspots, loan, giving them buying computers for loan, getting our libraries involved. We are gonna model it off of E-Rate, which is the nation's largest education technology program. And it provides more funding to districts with higher percentages of students on the free and reduced lunch program. So it's like laser targeted at the populations and communities that were most likely to have a problem with this. We released the text of this decision, which is like bureaucratic, is all out and full of wonky details. But the goal is by the end of June, we're going to open up a window for schools and libraries across the country to apply for that funding. Because I think if they do, we're going to make a meaningful dent in the homework gap and we're going to get more kids connected. And that is just the start of making the kind of repairs that you know we need to make for so many students in this country who have fallen behind, but we can use um, 
online learning now to help them catch up and keep up with their homework and keep up with schoolwork. So I'm very excited for this emergency connectivity fund. And um, I, uh, I think it's going to do some good, but we're going to have more work to go, more work to do. That's my answer. Thank you for that. That is exactly the answer. Lots of great news. Uh, thank you so much. So up next, we have Amy Hinojosa, uh, President and CEO for MANA, a national Latina organization. Uh, Amy, the floor is yours. Thank you, Alejandro, and thank you so much for convening this conversation. It's so important for us to have this one-on-one -on -one time with the chairwoman, with Congressman BC, to, to ask the questions, right, that are really plaguing our communities. And first, I just want to say thank you and congratulations to Chairwoman Rosenworcel and her staff, because the taking the funds allocated for the EBB program and turning it around really underscored what we've always known that you understand about this issue, Chairwoman, and that's the urgency of it. Because pre-pandemic, 40% of Latino households were not connected. One in four households were only using a mobile device. And then COVID just exacerbated that to unimaginable levels uh, as you were describing. And so my, my question for you, and you know, and I think of it from so many different intersectional angles, right? I think of it from Latinas and jobs. I think of women who didn't have the, the ability to work online, right? And, and transition in that way when the pandemic hit. I think of women who lost their jobs, whose families were relying on them, women who, who are caregivers, women who became um, not only, um, uh, you know, the heads of their, who were the heads of their household, but also then had to become teacher to, to their students as they went to transition to learning online. And so, uh, you know, as, as uh, the chairwoman said it, as we're coming out of this and as we start to make the plans in the future, my question um, for both you and Congressman Vesey, my fellow Texan, is what, where can advocates be helpful in one, continuing to convey the urgency that we feel for our community getting so much further behind as a result of COVID, but where we were previously. And then how do we um, help you tell the story in a way that conveys that urgency to Congress to codify permanent solutions for this that keep us at the level that we need to be to make sure that we never fall back into this pattern where something like a global pandemic puts us back even further than we were to begin with. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, Chairwoman, do you mind? No, you go right ahead. <laughs> um, well, I think the first thing that, uh, Amy, that we can do, that, that you can do as, as an advocate is to make sure that the community understands, um, you know, exactly where they can go to access these resources. I'm always worried about, uh, uh, communities that are marginalized being able to, um, to access certain services. Uh, I know like, for instance, you know, with, with, with tax, with tax season being delayed this year, one of the things that worries me every year that I, that, that I'm surprised about is that uh, how many of our low income communities don't know that, Hey, you don't have to go give up, you know, two, 300, $400 of your income tax check. You can, there are these community resources here. Uh, we have people that still in, in my district, large numbers of people that still don't even use the earned income tax credit. Uh, and, you know, that sort of thing worries me. And so when we do things like EBB, we want to make sure that people know about them. And so making sure that you help spread the word to communities so they can get connected, so we can make sure that these young people that hadn't logged back in for school, that their parents know that there is an alternative uh, that's not going to uh, be a financial harm to them. You know, that to me, that's the sort of thing that can be so, so helpful because. You know, when I'm out and about in the community a lot and I'm asking people questions, hey, do you know about this program? Do you know uh, about how you can be uh, get broadband service? You'd be surprised how many people say, no, I didn't know that that was going on. I didn't know that that was happening. And we really need our neighborhood advocates to spread awareness uh, about these programs. And, and I have some information uh, for us to, to be able to share. Uh, and I would hope that we'd be able to maybe put that on the screen uh, uh, so everyone can can have that, uh, because to me, I mean, if, if if people don't know about the information, then it's really it's it's not going to be helpful. Uh, you know, think about all these young people uh, that haven't logged back in. 
Uh, and, 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 you know, who's going to reach them, you know, who's going to be the person that's going to make sure that Catholic charities, whatever organization it may happen to be that are LULAC, that they know that, Hey, you know, these resources are available for you and your families. And I always worry about that just because I see that, uh, so often with other programs that are hugely beneficial and useful for communities that never get utilized. Mm -hmm. That is so well stated. Um, so here's my simplistic answer. I think our collective superpower right now, as people who care about broadband affordability, making sure that everyone has access, is making this program work. And it works spectacularly well. Because if we can all commit to doing that, we're gonna make it a lot easier for Congressman Beasy to turn around to his colleagues and say, this great thing that I started, I want it to be permanent. I want it to be something that uh, we don't just do because of a pandemic, we do because it's good for the entire United States. And so I think our superpower is coming together and making this work. I want Congressman Beasy to be able to turn to his colleagues and it be the easiest ask. And so I think that's the way we're gonna do it. And to that end, look, I'll make myself, the FCC folks, available any day of the week, any time to any organization. We know that we can't preach from Washington and get the word out like you do. So um, we will make loads of people available uh, to help you ha help make that happen. Paloma Perez from, is uh, on this call from my office. You can reach out to her. And um, frankly, because we're doing this over Zoom, I don't even have to you know, leave my dining room table. We're going to make this stuff happen. And we will help you reach out to whoever you think can help make us this program, help make this program a success. It's that important. Absolutely, 100% agreed. Um, we've got uh, Mr. Brent Wilkes, VP of Hispanic Federation up next. Brent, the floor is yours. Well, thank you, Congressman BC and, and Chairwoman Rosenworcel. You guys are incredible champions for our community and um, we really appreciate um, both your work on the EBB and other affordability programs. Um, but we do want to pledge that, as, as you can see, of course, with our campaign, that we do want to make this program successful. And we are going to work hand in hand with you to really work to, to ensure that our community knows about the opportunity as well as is effectively using it. Um, and I, I'm almost a little bit hesitant to ask this question because you kind of just answered it, <laughs> Jessica, but here it goes anyway. So. So we are, of course, um, thinking about the future too, and we do want to see this become a permanent program or something like it. And one of the things that we we were um, trying to trying to grapple with was there there seems to be two strategies on the table right now. You've got the existing Lifeline program. Um, one point that was stretched a bit to cover data and some broadband, um, quite a bit different than the emergency broadband benefit. Um, especially when you look at the funding source, um, mm -hmm. you know, Lifeline is funded by the carriers themselves and uh, EBB, of course, by, by the general treasury. And then also the types of requirements that are in place. Um, you know, the Lifeline has some very specific commitments that the carriers have to meet in order to be able to offer Lifeline service. Uh, the, the emergency broadband benefit was right, uh, much more open. And I was hoping that perhaps if, if we could start off with, with the congressman, if he could just describe what does he think is the best path going forward if we were to make this a permanent program, would it be best to try to take Lifeline and extend it and to be more robust, perhaps better funded with a broader base of support um, and make that the vehicle for a permanent broadband subsidy? Or would it be better to just kind of go a separate way like you have with the emergency broadband benefit and to um, try to come up with something completely different? So that's the question. You know, I would, there are two things that I, you know, wouldn't want, would not want to do. The first one is that, you know, I wouldn't want to, you know, recreate the wheel. And I do think the Lifeline program is obviously a very good uh, uh, program that works uh, very well. The other thing in Congress, too, is, is that's tough, is that always having to look for money to pay for anything uh, is, is always a challenge. And always puts things up in the air and puts things uh, in limbo. And so, you know, and, and, I, and I worry about that because it becomes a, a, a huge fight. Uh, and then the, the, 
the commitment, funding amounts and the commitments, you know, become very politicized, uh, you know, which is a, another reason, you know, again, while I was talking about the importance of making sure that people know about these programs so they're being utilized because people will see that something is not being utilized and they'll look at it as an opportunity to pounce and try to, to, to kill something. And so, you know, what I, what I would love to see uh, the Lifeline program uh, 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 become more robust and be able to be used as a as a more permanent um, um, way to fund, because I just, you know, trying to come to Congress whenever, you know, this needs replenishing, you know, from the from the five short terms that I've been in uh, is very problematic. Well, I don't know that especially I could, depending yeah. on who's in charge. I don't know that I could say that better than the congressman. Um, if we stick with Lifeline, we need to make it broadband centric. Yeah. It's traditionally really been organized around voice telephony. And it's clear to me that dial tone in the digital age is internet access. That's something we're going to have to fix. And if we um, reinvigorate the emergency broadband benefit program, I... Uh, I want us to figure a way to do that where we don't have to, um, you know, wait for uh, what happens on the appropriations cutting room floor every year, because it's been my experience that when you have programs that are designed for low income communities, marginalized communities, depending on who's in charge, they can be among the first to get cut. So mindful of those two things, I don't think I have a clear answer for you, Brent except to say that this is a conversation we're gonna to wanna to continue having with everyone who's on this call um, because we wanna figure out a way to have a sturdy, viable program going forward. Yeah, and Brent, you've, you've seen these other programs that aren't uh, life, that aren't tech related, that aren't broadband related. You've seen how they've been almost used to pit communities against one another. Mm -hmm. uh, with this is so important to me that we need, and not that the other things aren't, not that SNAP is not, you know, not that Medicaid is not important. I, I don't want anybody to misunderstand me. Uh, but really for our, our, our young people, uh, this is so important that if we can figure out a way how to pull it out of that whole politics to where you, you all of a sudden, you know, have people in the house for saying, why are my hardworking people paying for your people to have, you know, access to broadband? If we can figure out a way how to not let the conversation uh, uh, go there the way it is for these other hugely important programs that I talked about, then we need to figure out a way how, how to do that. Because, uh, you know, if not, are these communities be left out of the future and we cannot afford to let that happen as a country. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Agreed with you. Thank you. And you know, I, I will point out that um, this is an industry that does has survived the the COVID pandemic fairly fairly robustly. So most of our internet uh, provider friends and um, the edge providers uh, have done well throughout this uh, downturn in the economy. And so um, I'm hoping that they can help step up to the table too, and and perhaps avoid those kind of um, putting room for uh, disputes. Uh, Congressman VC that you mentioned, because that is always a challenge and a worry that, that we have about keeping a program funded for the long haul. We want it to be kind of a permanent source of funding that will always be there year in, year out. So appreciate appreciate uh, the great comments. Thank you. And I want to be uh, respectful of everybody's time. I know that we are at about 2 p.m. Um, and people have to hop off. But we have uh, four more questions by Yanida, who is the president of the uh, Labor Council for Latin American Advancement. Amanda Fernandez, who's the president and CEO of Latinos for Education, and Lily Gangas uh, from uh, the Kapoor Center, as well as council member Karina Lopez. So I wonder if you ladies wouldn't mind uh, just asking your question one after another, and then we'll do kind of like a, like a wrap up with uh, Representative VC and the chairwoman. Uh, Yanita, if you wouldn't mind going first, that'd be great. Thank you, Alejandro, and thank you for this opportunity. It's a great conversation. Um, uh, thank you for the leadership of our HTTP. Uh, my question is, and I share, I mean, I think most of my question was answered, but for me, it is about training. We all know that the basics of anybody's being able to achieve, it starts at home. So for me, it's training. Those parents, like, for example, I think it was uh, Congressman Basie who was saying that we're, we are concerned whether or not people are getting this information and using this 
a great program. So are we doing this in language that people can access? The access, are we getting, I mean, every single place? I know that we talk a lot about internet, but many of our people, because they don't have access to internet, nor they have the time because many of those, many parents have up to two or three jobs in order to sustain and be able to uh, provide for their children. So for me, it's training for those parents. What are we doing to that? And what, in which other ways are we promoting this uh, beside the ones that were described here by you, uh, Chairwoman and Congressman uh, Vizzi? What else are we doing? The Latino community use a lot of their cell phones. So I'm basically trying to see if we're doing something else around that area. Thank you. Appreciate it. Amanda? Hi, good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Congressman VC and Chairwoman Rosenworcel. Uh, so I lead an organization that focuses on Latino education. So thank you for talking so much about education. It's super important. I also wear the hat of uh, serving on the State Board of Education here in Massachusetts, and I'm so uh, well aware of the issues that we had, the multiple issues that we had with tech equity. Uh, my question is around um, sort of the state and federal relationship. Uh, I'm part of a coalition and actually Latinos for Education led a coalition to um, ensure that there would be an amendment in the governor's budget to focus on the issue of tech equity to bring together multi-sector stakeholders to actually address everything that you're talking about here, but at the state level. So I'm just wondering if you could say a little bit more about uh, the work that you're doing federally and how that translates to uh, state level work and how uh, we should be thinking about it. Thank you. Thanks, Amanda. Lily and then Karina. Sounds good. Thank you so much for organizing. My name is Lily. I'm the Chief Tech Community Officer of the CAPER Center, where we're focused on diversifying the tech ecosystem. And with that said, we look at everything from K through 12 all the way through entrepreneurship and venture capital. Uh, but specifically through my work uh, in Oakland, we've been doubling down on the <clears throat> broadband access and adoption. And so I'm getting direct. I'm going to get a little real here, right? We want the EVP to be successful. And we know that we have to be on the ground with the community. And so we've been organizing some pop-ups, but the questions that I keep getting are a few concerns. One is the, the fact that the CBOs are doing the heavy lift of onboarding the families with no additional resources. And so what is the opportunity to provide more funding for these organizations that are literally on top of everything that they're doing, they have to do this additional work and they themselves have to train up their their staff and so I'm taking on additional you know responsibilities to support that as well and so that's a concern the other part is I'm so glad that we're talking about the permanent solution because that's been another concern with some of these organizations that I've heard directly why should we be putting all this work in additional if we don't know when the pro when the program's going to run out how are folks going to know that that they're going to be disconnected or not are they still going to be charged and so I think that there's some very tactical um uh, information that I think would be great to continue to share out so that way with more confidence we're able to make this program be successful so thank you for leading the charge on that permanent solution and then my last question it's really the, the previous has been commentary but my question is really a little bit related to what Amanda was sharing my concern right now is that there's a great momentum at the federal level but my concern is that the states and cities without the right and bold leadership, and if they continue to focus on some of the short-sighted solutions, we're going to miss out on a, probably a once-in-a-lifetime generation of an infrastructure investment. So what can this collective of organizations do to make sure that we're keeping the pressure? Is it collecting data? Is it collecting stories? How do we get this group specifically here to move from this dialogue but to action and data? As you shared earlier, those maps are are can be um, disorienting for a lot of planning, planning, but also economic decisions. So a lot of content, but I just wanted to make sure that we are uh, also leaving this conversation with actionable steps that we can do as a, as a collective as well. Thank you, Lily. Congress member Lopez. Hi, my name is Karina Lopez and I'm a council member with the city of San Leandro. I sit, I'm here with David Luna, who is the president of the um, Hispanic elected local officials for the National League of Cities. I am on the board with him on that, as well as we both serve on the board of the National League of Cities. We have formerly have both served as chairs of the Information Technology and Federal Advocacy Committee for the National League of Cities. So uh, David and I have been sort of Latino leaders, leaders um, for the NLC on um, 
on these topics. And we're very thankful and grateful for all your work. We're very excited for today. One of the things that we have we're concerned about here is that there's a lot of discussion around, you know, um, you know, broadband and robust access to uh, robust broadband that's affordable, as well as digital literacy. But the other missing component has not been discussed so much, and we would like for that to be addressed. And that has to do with hardware. Um, you know, so if we have broadband and access to hardware broadband and have access to classes and so forth, but no hardware at home. Um, you know, I mean, how does this really, how does this really work mechanically? And that's that's a missing component that's really been, um, you know, not addressed in a lot of these national dialogues that we really want to see have happen. The other thing, just a commentary on the mobile hotspots, just here as a council member, having served as a disaster council here for my my city, is the mobile hotspots have not been robust enough, as we all know. And so that's really, a, in my personal opinion, a more of a band-aid or, um, you know, a stop gap approach, but we really do need to have, you know, hard line um, wiring into homes and something that's more future-proof in nature. Thank you. I appreciate that. A lot of ground to cover, but the, the good thing is it looks like it's all about kind of regional, local solutions and how we can all work together. So um, I will turn the mic over to Representative VC and uh, Chairwoman Rosenworcel to uh, wrap up. Thank you so much. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I want to kind of touch on uh, Ms. Moreno and Ms. Lopez's uh, question, uh, because they talked a lot about, uh, um, you know, the hardware. And Ms. Moreno, I think that you had mentioned the the uh, people's uh, cell phones. Uh, and that is such a good point. I don't think that a lot of people realize that. It's just like when you go into... Uh, 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 you know, black and Hispanic communities around the country, like the one that I represent, a lot of people are very dependent up on their device devices to be connected. And it's their phone. It's not a, it's not hardware, you know, like a laptop. Uh, and even in school districts like mine, that made sure that every home had a Chromebook in the fourth independent school district. Not every child had a Chromebook. So kids were at during pandemic were actually having to share Chromebooks because they couldn't send home more than one Chromebook to each household. Uh, and it is a huge uh, part of the puzzle that has to, to be solved. Uh, different people have different opinions on it. I asked a young man that was from, I believe he was from Chicago, uh, about, uh, you know, should we be looking for more ways to make sure that people that have their, their that, that are dependent on their cell phones, that we just uh, that, that that we go ahead and 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 look for ways to make that easier for them to to use and connect with broadband uh, and uh, and he thought that there was still a lot of uh, value in people being able to you know have a more traditional uh, you know laptop or hardware where they can actually use, uh, have a keyboard and learn typing skills and different things like that which I agree with. Uh, and that is uh, that, you know, there are, there are programs um, uh, around the country that address this. Uh, one of our county commissioners here in Tarrant County has a, a generation laptop program. But as everybody on the and I talked earlier about how the technology always changes. It's not like your, you know, your grandparents, Curtis Mathis television that they had, you know, with the record player attached where they probably got a good 10 or 15 years attached to it. You know that that device that you buy, it probably is is not going to to work after a certain amount of time. It's just not uh, going to uh, even be uh, even now. Even your television now, you know, after a while, you'll get something saying this this flat screen TV that you have no longer supports Roku or it no longer supports Netflix, and you'll get those messages. This technology changes and moves so much more rapidly. Uh, and that is something that we have that that we're definitely going to have to figure out how to address. I think that for young people, if we're talking about uh, you know uh, young people and and them having access, it's, it it needs to be addressed through the through the school districts, obviously. And uh, whether it's a district or a countywide school system, uh, and the federal government giving assistance uh, to these local uh, entities that make sure that they can keep up with that technology and to make sure that all the kids can have access to this. And I know that, uh, look, if you have a household where, where there are, you know, five or six kids that, 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 you know, can be problematic. I'm not saying that that's, that, that that's easy, 
but we ought to be trying to do everything we can to make sure that each child uh, has uh, uh, access to this hardware. So uh, one child is like, is, won't be like, well, I'll have to do my homework at 10 o'clock at night while my brother works on his book report. We just don't want to get into that type of situation. And so I, I appreciate your questions on that. Alejandro, I'm sure that there were some other questions in there too, if you want to try to uh, refresh me, but I wanted to go ahead and turn it over to the chairwoman and, and let her uh, uh, talk in the meantime. Yeah, well, thank you. And what you're saying about technology moving fast, um, it's like lightning speed. And I feel that way, and I'm the acting chairwoman of the FCC. So how do most households feel? It is um, it is hard for policymakers and parents, all of us, to keep up. Okay, so I heard a bunch of questions, and I'm going to try lightning speed to answer them. Uh, there was one about hardware. Here's what's important to know. Emergency broadband benefit. $50 a month in support for broadband. That number goes up to $75 a month uh, if you live on tribal lands plus a one-time $100 discount off of a laptop or a tablet. So that's a piece of hardware that Congress already thought about in the emergency broadband benefit. In the emergency connectivity fund, which is to help schools and libraries get kids connected, there's a whole lot of support and funding for laptops and all sorts of other devices. So we've thought about the device component for the first time here, and I think you're right to criticize, frankly, Congress and the FCC for not putting two and two together in the past, but we've actually done that with our most recent programs. Uh, someone else talked about making this program permanent and how long it would go on for. Gosh, I wish I had a crystal ball, I could tell you, but because we've never had a program like this before, my predictions are not so great. But I do know this, we made sure that every carrier that signs up a consumer is not allowed to just continue that consumer when the program's over because we know that maybe that household can't afford it. So the household has to opt in going forward and the carrier has to let the consumer know a month in advance that the program's coming to an end. That was an effort to add some transparency to the fact it won't last given that it has limited funding. Um, someone else also said data versus narratives. We need both. We need you collecting information in your backyard about what's going on, what populations are disconnected. And I'll tell you, it never really goes very far if you can't also describe a kid sitting in the parking lot trying to do their homework. So I would say collecting both of those is really important. That's how you get things done. And then um, there was more about outreach and I just agree we need to fund more outreach initiatives. That's how we make this successful. And then tech equity in state legislatures. I think the more initiatives at the state and local level on digital equity, the better. This problem is big. It affects everything in civic and commercial life right now. And households that can't get online don't have a fair shot. So every single initiative to raise awareness and make that change is worth it. And I wouldn't want federal activities to cloud out and prevent there being good activities at the local and state level. That's my lightning round attempt. So there you go. <laughs> I really appreciate that. Thank you again to Representative BC and Chairwoman Rosenworcel and to all of you, uh, our, our leaders, um, our CEO roundtable for joining us today. Uh, my commitment to all of you is that we will continue the dialogue and remain, and remain connected um, and do everything that we can to make the EVB a success and to um, ensure that we are promoting uh, effective kind of uh, policies that center the experience of multicultural communities and ensure that our voices are at the table. So thank you all again for joining us and have yourselves a great Monday. La pandemia del COVID-19 nos enseñó la importancia de mantenernos conectados por medio del Internet. El nuevo programa de beneficios de emergencia de banda ancha o EBB provee a los hogares hasta 50 dólares al mes para aliviar el costo de la conexión del Internet en casa. Este beneficio está disponible para las familias latinas sin importar su estatus legal, siempre y cuando haya algún miembro de la familia que tenga un número de ITIN o sea un estudiante que reciba almuerzo gratis o a precio reducido. Conecta a tu familia a nuevas posibilidades. Visita www.ebbparami.com para obtener más información.